Here now to discuss the latest findings on lung cancer is Dr. Leora Horn, who is the Associate Professor of Medicine and Assistant Vice Chairman for Faculty Development and Director of Thoracic Oncology Research Program at Vanderbilt in Ingram Cancer Center. Hi, Dr. Horn, thank you so much for coming here and chatting with us today. Thanks for having me. Well, sure. So there have been more long-term follow-up data of the available agents in lung cancer that we've seen this year. Can you discuss the five-year overall survival data from the Keynote 001 trial? Sure, so the Keynote 001 study, as you recall, is the, it's a large 550 patient study that looked at um, pembrolizumab as a single agent in patients. It looked at a first-line cohort, a second-line cohort, third-line cohort. It also looked at patients who are PD-L1 positive as well as patients who are PD-L1 negative. And what we saw to, at ASCO this year was the five-year survival data that showed in an all-comer patient population, the overall survival was around 15%. And in the patients who are PD-L1 positive, the overall survival was 23%. That data sort of mirrors what we saw last year at AACR with the Checkmate 003 data, which also showed with nivolumab as a single agent in an all-comer patient population, smaller numbers, it was just over 100 lung cancer patients, that the five-year overall survival was 16%. So what that tells us is these drugs, when they do work, they're having a durability in a small subset of patients. So they're not working in everybody, but it is a step forward, because when I first started practicing, the median survival for stage one to stage four lung cancer was 15% at five years. And so now we've got a cohort of stage four lung cancer patients who are surviving, overall survival at five years is 15%. So we're making some progress, but it would be nice to see if we could bump that even further. Definitely. Now we also have three-year overall survival data from the Pacific trial looking at uh, duralumab in stage three non-small cell lung cancer. So what are your thoughts on these follow-up? So the data is encouraging. Um, you know, I think that it gives us even more um, encouragement to use duralumab in patients after concurrent chemo radiation therapy. The majority of patients with stage three disease will recur in the first few years after therapy. So I'm, when we're seeing this three-year overall survival data that is clearly a separation between placebo and duralumab, we clearly have a drug that is active, that is helping us cure more lung cancer patients, because in that stage three setting, we're looking for cure, not just prolonging progression-free survival. And so I think it's really encouraging data, um, and Duralumab has become a standard of care in the U.S. for all patients after concurrent chemo radiation therapy, and in Europe, it's for patients who are a pd one score greater than 1% or higher. So now the relay trial is another one that is getting a little bit of buzz here. So this is looking at the frontline combination of ramucirumab and erlotinib uh, in EGFR mutant on small cell lung cancer. So what do you think are a couple of important things to note about this combination? So I think there are two things. It shows us that when you combine an EGFR inhibitor and a VEGF inhibitor, you have increased efficacy compared to the EGFR inhibitor alone. We saw that a couple of years ago at ASCO with the Japanese trial that looked at erlotinib plus bevacizumab. We've seen it with the ECOG trial that Tom Stinchcomb left looking at erlotinib plus bevacizumab. And we've seen it now as well with the erlotinib plus ramucirumab. I think there are important factors though that we need to think about is we're combining an oral drug with an IV agent, so it's patient factors of do you want to bring your patient into the hospital to get an IV drug when they could just be at home and see you every few months instead of every three weeks. We also see a lot more toxicity when you're adding a VEGF agent to an EGFR TKI. Um, there's the hypertension, there's proteinuria, and there's some of the other toxicities that these agents, when you combine, can have. And we also need to put this trial into context with first-line osimertinib. The progression-free survival on osimertinib alone was 18 months. And so unless we're seeing like a dramatic improvement in progression-free survival, I'm not sure that this is a regimen that I'm going to adopt at my institution. There are some ongoing trials. Um, so Helena Yu is leading a study looking at osimertinib and ramucirumab in patients who are EGFR mutant positive compared to osimertinib alone. And so it still gives us some pause for thought. And then there also, we also saw the study at ASCO this year looking at gefitinib and chemotherapy in the EGFR mutant patient population. I think the biggest thing we know for these patients is the targeted therapies don't work forever. And unlike when a checkpoint inhibitor works, we're going to see durable responses. These patients will eventually progress on their targeted therapy. And so how can we maximize their time and minimize their toxicity on those therapies? Those are some really great points. The safety is obviously very important to talk about. The, now, speaking of targeted therapies, um, what are some other agents that we've seen get some um, discussion here at ASCO, especially with some of these more um, uh, less common molecular abnormalities? Yeah, so I, I think from ASCO, the take home point is you should be testing and you probably should be testing everybody. Yeah. Testing everybody because of the MET exon 14 skipping mutation, which we know from two abstracts today with tapotinib and capmatinib that MET exon 14 can occur in squamous. 
It can occur commonly in smokers, and there are now two active agents. They're both in clinical trials, but there are two agents that we're seeing 50 plus percent response rates. With Tapotinib, we saw a progression-free survival approaching a year. And with Capmatinib as well, a drug that's really active in the CNS, we don't have that data yet with Tapotinib. The toxicities of these drugs seem to be a class effect, so you know, edema seemed to be in both, both classes, but we saw that with Prozotinib as well, which we know is a MET drug, although it's got approval and other indications. So patients should be tested for the MET exon 14 skipping mutation, because I think that these drugs will eventually become available, and if not, at least get your patients to a center that has a clinical trial. We also saw really great data with the blue 667 drug in patients with RET fusions. Um, highly active, over 70% response rate, um, really good toxicity profile, and a durable progression-free survival. Now, patients who are RET positive seem to be closer to what we see with the, EGF, with the EGFR out, the ROS1, more commonly the younger never smokers. But nevertheless, if you don't test for it, you won't know that this, you have active drugs for your patients. So I think more to come for targeted therapy for another cohort of patients. Definitely. Sorry. Th oh. No, go ahead. <laughs> Can I add one other? Yeah. I think the other interesting data that um, was not presented at a lung session, but it was in developmental therapeutics, but we finally may have a drug for patients who are KRAS positive. Um, Amgen had a drug, AMG501, um, that showed some nice activity in that cohort of patients. Still early clinical trials. Um, I'm looking forward to opening that trial at our institution, but we've never had a drug for patients who are KRAS positive, so hopefully this is something new for patients who have the G12C mutation. Definitely, that's really exciting. Um, now, what are your thoughts on some of the advances in small cell lung cancer? We've also seen some data with uh, Lurbanectin in here at this year's meeting. Yeah, so small cell, I think, was a little bit thinner at ASCO this year. Um, we did see encouraging data with lubronectidin in the phase two study with a 35% response rate. I think we need to wait for the phase three because often a phase two looks really promising and the phase three data is not as promising. I think that the difficult part is um, was mentioned in the discussion yesterday by Dr. Bess about lubronectidin is the fact that in the phase three data, it's combined with an anthracycline. And we know that it's often a little bit difficult to give doxorubicin in patients with small cell lung cancer because of their comorbid disease and cardiac function, but it does look like an active agent and hopefully it will become something that's available in the third line setting, uh, or sorry, second line setting um, for patients who progress on uh, platinum etoposide. Well, Dr. Horn, thank you so much for coming here today and chatting with us about everything that's going on in lung cancer. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Sure, thanks.